Welcome to this podcast series on pseudoscience, fake news, and how to fight back, supported by a grant from the Open Society Foundation and in partnership with the Challenging Pseudoscience Group at the Royal Institution of Great Britain. My name is Robert Pyra. Together with my colleague, Professor Marius Turda, we're inviting you to join a conversation about the meaning of history and the role of science in today's society. Our subject in this series is how history and science have become weaponized to support political agendas in East Central Europe, particularly during the last few years. This is intended as a lively and urgent contribution to the understanding of pseudoscience and of the uses and abuses of history in the era of so-called fake news. My guest today is Jan Grabowski, Professor of History at the University of Ottawa and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Jan is an expert on the history of the Holocaust in Poland, as well as relations between Jews and Poles during the Second World War. As a historian, it's fair to say he has frontline experience of present-day memory politics in Poland, and these experiences give him a unique perspective on which today's interview will draw. Jan, welcome. Well, Robert, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here with you. Thank you. Before we begin, I'd like to start by asking you about today's political context in Poland. Listeners will, of course, be familiar with headlines about the country's so-called illiberal course under the regime of the right-wing conservative Law and Justice Party since 2015, following a brief stint in government in the early 2000s. This context has, at least in part, informed some official responses in Poland to your 2018 work, Dalej jest not, a two-volume study of the fate of Jews in selected counties of occupied Poland, while attracting positive attention internationally. We'll doubtless come on to the detail of this response, Jan, but perhaps you wouldn't mind opening by talking about this wider context in Poland today, particularly as it relates to the projects of cultural memory being pursued by the government and how history is treated, including in a narrower educative sense by the current regime. Thank you for this very broad question. I will try to tackle perhaps it from several sides and feel free to intervene whenever you think I'm straying too far away from the core of the issue at hand. Well, so in terms of bringing the topic close to our listeners, I would have to stress that the role of history and the uses of history in Central and Eastern Europe go far beyond what we are usually used to in the countries uh, such as Canada, in my case, or in Great Britain to an extent too. So the problem here is that politics and uh, history on, are intertwined, are uh, inseparable and are being used and uh, preyed upon, history is being preyed upon uh, by various uh, political uh, parties. Now, in the most recent case in Poland, as you mentioned, um, most of us are familiar with this uh, illiberal, let's say, trend or illiberal revolution or counter-revolution, which tends to undermine uh, the underpinnings, uh, the foundations of the civic and democratic society. And unfortunately, an attack perpetrated nowadays by the current authorities on Polish history is a part of a very large design, as I mentioned, one which wills or wishes to undermine these foundations. So what happens here is that since, uh, and the problem is that actually this attack predates the arrival to power of the currently ruling nationalists. This uh, particular team arrived in 20. 2015. And however, the so-called history policies uh, of the Polish state predated the arrival of the nationalists because they are an element which somehow unfortunately unifies the Polish society, which is, I would call it, taking false pride in history. False pride because it is based upon half-truths and very often untruths. So what, what you see nowadays is uh, a country which uh, where the authorities actually link up with opposition and this is most troubling because they want basically to create a vision of the past that has little to do with historical findings with historians research with let's say state of knowledge but it has everything to do with a need to create a positive optimistic vision of the past to reconcile 
let's say, own myths with expectations. And unfortunately, this is a job that has tremendous, uh, let's say, impact on the way people think, on the way people vote. And I guess we can address these issues as we go along. But uh, unfortunately, history is being used as a platform to consolidate Polish nation against rather than for certain issues. So in terms of Holocaust history, which I study, historians like um, myself, like I, like uh, groups of uh, colleagues with whom I am working and writing, we insist that um, Polish-Jewish relations uh, during the war were extremely troubled, that uh, actually the attitudes of the Polish society were permeated with anti-pre-war and wartime anti-Semitism, that the, not collusion, but let's say not cooperation, even, but the certain complicity for certain of certain segments of the Polish society in the German genocidal project cannot be denied, should not be denied. And here, this kind of historical research triggers extraordinary anger and concern of the Polish authorities, and of course, large segments of the Polish society that are not interested in acquiring this knowledge, that are all interested in rejecting this, these findings. So now this is the scenario which explains the arrival on international scene of these curious documents, such as the Polish Holocaust Law of 2018. But once again, this kind of feel-good historical narrative based on wishful thinking, not on historians' findings, is something that today is being successfully used by the nationalists, not only to consolidate their own electorate, but also looking for votes outside their usual habitual pool of, of electorate. Thank you, Professor. I wanted to expand briefly on your observation about how historical memory of the Holocaust in particular represents a rare point of agreement between rivals in Poland's well-publicized culture wars. I mentioned this because the dividing lines in Polish society, loosely corresponding to the incumbent party and the second largest grouping, Platforma Obywatelska, are otherwise stark. For example, on questions of citizenship-based democracy, immigration, abortion, or LGBT rights, for example. Indeed, when the Law and Justice Party first held power from 2005 to 2007, they also created divisions over other areas of national history, politicizing Poland's self-appointed Institute of National Remembrance to conduct so-called lustration, investigating figures even like Lech Wałęsa as part of what some saw as a divisive witch hunt into the country's communist past. And yet, on the Holocaust, your subject, you suggest there is a unifying force that the current government can, in fact, instrumentalize. I think it's, it's good that you mentioned yeah. the initial, yeah. the first, you know, regime, the first, let's say, two years in power of uh, law and uh, justice party between 2005 and 2007, because it's actually a harbinger of things to come. I mean, they clearly demonstrated that they are not really interested in, let's say, citizenship-based society, that their idea of Volksgemeinschaft, their idea of of national community is blood related okay these are people who are deeply devoted to the very, I would say, 1930s a vision of a nation based on very much uh, ethnicity. And uh, this, this harkens back to the to really dark periods of European history. And they are, without any actually shame and hesitation, drawing on this legacy. They started drawing, of course, back in uh, the early years of the 21st century. But they do it in a very shameless way today, for instance. For instance, uh, putting on in this pantheon of national heroes, of leaders, leaders of, uh, let's say, people to be emulated, to be followed, uh, one Roman Dmowski. For those um, of our listeners who are not familiar, we are talking about the founder of Polish so-called National Democratic Party, a person who was uh, founder of, he was, let's say, a not a founder, but he was, I would say, a godfather of modern, violent and vicious Polish anti-Semitism. He was the one who made it single-handedly, anti-Semitism, the weapon, the tool of choice, the weapon of choice. And uh, his admiration for Hitler was disturbingly, let's say, enthusiastic. His uh, deep distaste with liberal democracy. Now, this Roman Domowski has been elevated today uh, in by the Polish state uh, to a person that a founding father of Polish uh, 
modern Polish nation. Now, these things have tremendous importance. If they are repeated in schools time after time and time again, and this is just an example, there are many, many more. Other things is that uh, in the first years of the century, when they were in power, they, for instance, removed from school curricula. For me, it's very important what they do with school curricula. They removed uh, writers like, like Gombrowicz, a wonderful, wonderful author, who tended to be uh, like... Uh, I would say, intellectual beacon to many of Polish intelligentsia, including myself, raised under communism. But for us, his defiant, let's say, rejection of primitive nationalism has been a guiding light. So not by accident, Gombrowicz was fired from school, Polish schools in 2005 mm. and six and seven. Uh, so this nationalistic project is why, let's say, Holocaust stands at the very center of the fury. There is two simple reasons. One's, uh, one, of course, is that uh, Holocaust has become the only part of Polish history that is bothering anyone outside of Poland, let's say, with very few exceptions. Um, so the Polish authorities have no monopoly here. They don't control the narrative. So that makes them very, very, very anxious. And the second is that related to the first one is that since the Holocaust has become this benchmark of, uh, of evil, um, then if you are being, let's say, defined, your society, your nation, as somewhat complicit, well, it tends to, uh, let's say, as they say, put you, the good name of the Polish nation in trouble. And they are all about uh, this struggle for the good name of the Polish nation, which they do, of course, from wrong, let's say, coming out from wrong premises, deadly wrong premises, but that's how they construe their own world. And perhaps something that I will add still, we can go back to it later on, the fact is that in Poland, and it's it's quite a phenomenon actually. I don't think a an average Briton would could relate to it. Uh, in Poland, history, national history, has been elevated to the level of religion, and I'm not hesitant to use this uh, uh, this analogy here. Thank you for raising many interesting points here, Professor. I just wanted to highlight very briefly, for the benefit of listeners perhaps less familiar with Poland, your point about religion that's to say Catholicism, and its long-standing connection to unifying conceptions of the nation in public discourse. This is thanks in part, of course, to the church's ascribed institutional role in helping keep practices and structures alive of Polishness for more than a century when Poland was off the map and ruled by foreign powers until 1918, as well as later, of course, under communism, when the church for many symbolized resistance under a Polish pope, in fact, John Paul II. Your suggestion, of course, is that precisely this exalted status makes the sacralization of national discussions by the current regime a powerful and unifying tool, as well as perhaps provoking a distorted response, a particularly strong response, to the Holocaust. Turning now to our title, I wanted to ask how, in your view, educators and other actors in civil society might fight back by looking in more detail at some of the methods being used to reshape the national narrative in terms of policy. For instance, there have been direct attempts to question the methods and conclusions of historians, such as yourself, not least concerning the Holocaust, as well as changes to the curricula in schools that you've mentioned. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a very, I would say, toxic package, which is being now unpacked in Poland. And as you mentioned, the, the struggle, I mean, we are focusing, given my research interest, we are focusing on Holocaust. But uh, you mentioned here the question of communism. There is also a very important part that this nationalistic, I would say, not toying, but uh, falsification of history is their take on the history of uh, communist society in Poland. It's interesting that in this national mythology, there is no room for, for much compromise, right? So the thing is that um, for the followers of this simplistic historical narrative, communism is this foreign imposed form of slavery that has, you know, somehow dominated by force the Polish society, from which the Polish society emerged triumphantly uh, several decades later. Now, the problem is that I recall very well, and um, I don't have to base it on my recollections, but I can go to statistical data. By 1981, there were 3 million plus members of Poland 
Polish Communist Party, okay, which uh, would, together with families would make them a large chunk of adult population of Poland. So these people were not really forced to become members of the Communist Party. So this part, uh, this not so elegant part, that there was that uh, Polish People's Republic was also a Polish state. It was a creation of a few generations of Poles who worked within a system. So this gets today rejected completely. It is seen as a non, not Polish state, as a completely foreign imposition. So this is this is one thing. Uh, one more myth, which is being now propelled, pushed, and uh, somehow imposed and um, incalculated. Now the other thing is that uh, you mentioned the question of uh, the methods used. Now, what you have to understand is that we are not talking here about Russia or Turkey, where absolutely barbaric methods are being used simply not even to criticize historians, but simply to put them in their graves, so to say. We are talking in Turkey, but we are talking here in the case of Poland, we would like to see certain still elementary standards being maintained because Poland still is the member of a very elite gentleman's club, the European Union. So we would try to think that this benchmark of uh, barbaric behavior should be placed a bit higher in the case of members of an organization such as European Union, which proclaims itself in militant, let's say, struggle with the forces of darkness and obscurantism. Um, however, this is what happens in Poland today is this vicious denial of the Holocaust, which is not to say that they deny the factuality of the Holocaust. They simply deny the fact that Polish society had anything to do with the with the event now all of this is being conducted in atmosphere of verbal brutality which you can hardly imagine fostered and propelled by the official Polish agendas, institutions of the Polish state, including Ministry of Education, including various institutions such as the notorious Institute of National Remembrance so these are I mean, historians like I uh, see our own faces plastered on the first pages of weeklies, nationalistic or even centrist uh, pro-government weeklies with uh, with subtitles, uh, traitors, uh, deniers, um, slanderers of good name. Now, we have to understand that words, as we as historians know very well, words have a tendency of being transformed into deeds, into actions. Uh, and this kind of... Uh, evil that is being perpetrated now uh, uh, on independent scholars, uh, educators will definitely, if not does have already its consequences. So we are talking here about uh, about a brutalization of narrative, uh, brutalization also of things like firing people from work, of course. I, these, these things do happen here, especially in the case of schools and history teachers. So uh, we are entering a very dark period indeed, I would say, and I cannot be optimistic at this stage. So one thing that perhaps we need to, to discuss also or to expand on is that uh, And I think I will be right if I say it, that in no other state in the world there such a stress has been placed uh, on history as in Poland and is in terms of state expenditures related directly into the enforcement of the official party line. I'm talking here about uh, the 420 million lotus, which is about, uh, it's close to 100 million British pounds, a yearly budget of one, only one memory control organization institution, which is the IPN. But there are others. Institut Pileckiego, there is Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, there is the Ministry of Education, which go along, work along the same lines. And there are the NGOs, which are funded by the government. So all of this creates the, the paysage, the landscape of uh, extraordinary turbulent uh, struggle against my profession. Thank you for sketching this landscape, Professor. I was struck by your distinction between the methods used in countries like Russia and Turkey with those deployed in Poland, which appear to occupy a kind of in-between space due to membership of the European Union. In other words, lacking direct brutality, but nevertheless having strongly illiberal tendencies in the eyes of many Western commentators. Again, the example of the very well-funded Institute of National Remembrance that you mentioned appears to follow this pattern by amounting to a full state-sponsored takeover of certain strands of historical research. 
With this in mind, Professor, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on two questions. Firstly, can you give us any insight into the government's position on Polish universities within this context? Are they perhaps next in line for historical censorship? And second, your thoughts on the overall character of these illiberal developments we're describing. Would you say they're perhaps reactive, focusing only on certain topics, or are they part of a more programmatic agenda modelled, for instance, on the famous example of Viktor Orban in Hungary? I believe that there is a very well-construed political project which has been identified. I mean, the nationalists are not very shy about their intents. The, several years ago, long before the Law and Justice Party arrived in power, its leader, one Mr. Kaczynski, he proclaimed in one of his speeches that one day we shall build Budapest in Warsaw. Now, people sort of, you know, laughed at the time. It was perhaps five years before they came to power. But there is no doubt that they are reading from a book which can be called, I would call it Orban Putin book. These people know that democracy is a deadly threat for them. Let's say freedom of choice is a direct challenge to their rule. Now, once again, in order to control the society in order to force the illiberal change. They simply help themselves to the toolbox from history. And I don't think we mentioned here the question of refugees in 2015, the migrations from the South. It was something which, of course, fueled uh, nationalists across European continent, providing them with extraordinary fuel for their attacks. Now, in case of Poland, you could see history at work in a very, very precise way at the time. For me, as a historian of the Holocaust, this was completely surreal. I was listening in 2015 to these speeches of nationalists uh, who were vying for power, coming to power, and they were using this, let's say, imaginarium, the uh, ideas taken straight from the textbook of Nazi propaganda. And if you, to give you an example, in one of his speeches, the aforementioned Mr. Kaczynski said that we have here these migrants from the South bringing parasites and diseases. Now, in the Polish mind frame, the strangers, aliens who bring parasites have one name, and this name is Żydzi, or the Jews. And this uh, goes back all the way to 1941-42, huge campaign of hate led by the Nazis in Poland. In Polish language, they plastered public space with posters, they showed movies in the cinemas, uh, delivering the image of uh, typhus-ridden Jews, uh, and lice-ridden Jews. And this was inserted deeply into the imaginary world of Polish anti-Semitism. It exists until this very day. So if you say that a foreigner or an alien brings parasites and disease, there is only one kind of uh, parallel, which has been very quickly, of course, uh, detected by the political analysts in Poland, but it works, but it does work. Similar thing nowadays, you can see very same, very, very same dehumanization of your opponent in the case of the LGBT community. The thing is the arguments used by people like the Minister of Education, imagine a Minister of Education uh, telling that LGBT, they are not people. Okay, they said they are less than people. So this is, we as historians know that taking away humanity from your opponent, first of all, creates a common enemy, an enemy which is not any more dignified with the word of human being. What are the consequences? Of course, once again, we know. So these are the things which sort of, you know, pop right and left and center. And then going to your other question, so I think that the illiberal project was, they were geared from day one. The thing is that they, they, their attack on the judiciary, it was no accident. It was pre-planned. It was, it's happened right out of the gate. Um, they knew that they have to destroy the independence of the judiciary. Uh, and they did. The second was destruction of free media, which is being complete, slowly being completed nowadays with the takeover of local presses and the state TV has been long just a party tool. And now they move to universities. Now, the thing is, it is uh, less important, of course, because let's not delude ourselves. Universities are not all important. They are important, but, you know, the justice system of justice and media are way more important. 
So now what they started, let's say, moving their counter-revolution to the universities, what they do is now, they, as an example, they are dismantling the independence of one major Krakow University, which so-called pedagogical university, which has been chosen for a variety of reasons to be a testing ground, how to fire people who are thinking differently than the ruling classes. And the Minister of Education and Higher Education, this notorious Mr. Tarnek I mentioned before, who declared that the LGBT people are less than human beings. So he is now openly threatening to undermine the independence of the universities. So I would say this will be the, as they say in French, la prochaine étape, the next stage. This is interesting in the context of your own work, if you don't mind me saying, Professor, and your experiences as a scholar based outside Poland, who nevertheless faces legal challenges because of publishing things that might be accepted broadly internationally, but less so within Poland. I wanted to connect this to our wider discussion about illiberalism in the Polish case. Earlier, you also touched on another important strand of the wider DNA of illiberalism, if you like, namely a consciously emotional approach to history that to some extent either short circuits or attempts to short circuit rational fact-based approaches. In the UK, many of us, of course, became familiar with this style from the time of the Brexit campaign, notably in the form of a poster depicting a long queue of people who were clearly not white waiting en masse to enter the UK, falsely using the suggestion of Turkey using the EU. So in other words, with no basis in fact, but nevertheless pulling an emotional lever to stoke up fear. So emotion trumping fact. Once again, then, I'd like to turn to how we fight back against such factual distortion, use of emotion and and perhaps disinformation. For instance, looking at our own profession, perhaps we can't only rely on our own scientific reassurance using approaches rooted in sound methodology, in fact, um, meaning we can consider it sufficient just to publish works that merit the scrutiny of peer review and use accredited sources and methods. If that's not sufficient, and if that's the case, what tools do we then have left to at least raise awareness of these issues, in fact, perhaps beyond academia? Okay, well, that's a loaded one question, a large one, but let's just uh, tackle it in a few stages. First of all is that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Our historian's premise is that usually we assume that uh, producing high quality work based on factual evidence, we can have a a meaningful impact on the way the people, let's say, perceive their own past wrong. If there is a state filter, which will filter out, uh, as it does in Poland, the high quality but unpopular from official point of view evidence or writing, then of course we have to turn to other sources of our tools, how to act. In my case, what happened is, I can tell you quite precisely that I became a sort of, sort of public historian or engaged historian against my own will. It has happened, to be more precise, in 2013. It happened when I was simply on aesthetic grounds. I couldn't stand anymore the falsification of discourse surrounding the alleged Polish universality of help to Jews during the war. The propaganda, which was already very, very powerful under the democratic regime, which wanted to make us believe that the default position of the Polish society under the German occupation was helping their Jewish neighbors in a moment of crisis. Well, it's not true, it's false. And uh, there was a project uh, which I was uh, instrumental, not only I, but many other people in stopping, was building another monument of Jewish gratitude to Poles in front of the Museum of uh, History of Polish Jews in Warsaw, Pauline. There was a project, and that at this stage, I remember I have had it. I said, no, this is this is just too much for me. It's not a question of conscience. It's been good taste. It's in such a bad taste that I have to protest. And so the tools which we have as, as let's say, academia, members of academia, how we can counter these pernicious narratives. We don't have many resources, to be honest. You can divide them into things which we can do. Um, and this is a part of the struggle against the illiberal, let's say, democracy, as they say. So uh, one thing is things which can be done from the outside. Another is the things which can be per- perpetrated or done by the people inside, in this case, in Poland or in Hungary or elsewhere. Of course, the, the freedom of speeches 
this on uh, is threatened here and uh, our expectations cannot be as high but but there are certain things which can be done one which i tend to very strongly advocate for is that uh, we in the west i in canada uh, we have to provide the platforms to make this uh, people who are vocal who are strong let's say strongly committed to fighting this wave of illiberal tide or trying to stop it we have to give them platforms on which they can express themselves it can be a conference can be a fellowship it can be facilitating their access to print translations of their work into conference languages the second thing that i think we need to do is to confront to confront the agents of illiberalism imagine that uh, this notorious institute of national memory remembrance that i mentioned before and probably you heard about this but many of our listeners did not in the just last february they appointed the head of their office in wroclaw which is the second largest polish city a neo nazi i mean person who was you know raising his right arm and hitler hitler goes uh, so would, what more do you so the thing is these people should not have any kind of presence outside of poland and they do have presence they are trying to to sell themselves as historians they are not they are employees hired by the polish state to do the state's bidding so we have to confront the people who are as we embargo let's say putin's oligarchs we have to embargo people who are involved in destruction of free research who are falsifying the past and who are let's say making their own contribution to the destruction of the civic society So these are you know two things which can be done from the outside but most of all on the inside this is a big problem because I am spending half a year in Poland half a year in Canada so I can say I'm straddling these two worlds but my research is of course in Poland given the archives so I am very ill at ease to advise people in Poland what to do because I don't I'm not facing the choices that they are they are facing my salary is in auto I am not being fired although they try to get me fired I am not getting fired from my institution so it is easy for me to preach however there are certain universal rules that we need to apply borders of compromise which we detect while we are in these societies whether for instance we take an employment with an institution engaged in this distortion of the holocaust or uh, the uh, attack on liberal democracy so i believe there are things we can do but most of all we have to become and this is something that i did we have to lend our voice uh, to the public domain we have to be very outspoken we cannot delude ourselves that uh, you know uh, creating a podcast for our students will be enough it will not be enough mm. uh, so professor i'm sorry to interrupt I wondered whether you had any thoughts on whether the West should not share some of the responsibility for sharing, uh, stirring, sorry, Polish sensitivities around World War II in particular, and by extension the illiberal counterreaction in that country. I'm referring in particular to what some even consider to be a black and white approach to Polish history from from the outside, as in from outside Poland, reduced to a simple either or discussion of good Poland following certain norms or bad Poland breaking them without consideration of what some consider to be special sensitivities shaped by Poland's particularly destructive experience as one of the main theaters of World War II. I'm thinking for instance of when Obama referred to Hitler's death camps as Polish rather than specifically Nazi German ones which happened to be physically located in occupied Poland. Now while we know that this was just a linguistic slip there was of course a fierce reaction given that does the west not have a particular duty to help poland on what it perceives as this desired journey to liberalism by not inflaming these sensitivities and following on from that i also wanted to ask your view on what part the european union might play in this process it's a very broad question of course it applies to any regime that displays notionally liberal tendencies such as hungary today or austria in the early 2000s So clearly there are precedents for dealing with uh, so-called illiberal tendencies. In any case, as we move towards the end of our time today professor, I just wondered whether you had any reflections on these two potential tools in the Polish case. So to sum up, one the western gaze, whether we might treat Poland somewhat differently, and secondly concrete measures from the European Union. Thank you. I remember when I was still a student in uh, under the martial law our 
hour by hour, I mean, all Polish youth, uh, our hero was Margaret Thatcher. I mean, this was, uh, I know that I lost some of my English friends at the time because uh, for us, everyone who wanted basically to, you know, to, uh, to beat up the big red bear was our friend and ally. So at a certain point, uh, Margaret Thatcher said, terrorism thrives on appeasement. And I remember the statement made by her in the context of Cold War. But in, in the context of appeasement, I am generally speaking very reluctant to become enthusiastic or even vaguely uh, positively inclined toward it. And the thing is that if you decide to treat Polish or Ukrainian or Lithuanian uh, problems with history in kid gloves and when you start to pander to these nationalistic obsessions and i am not uh, hesitant to use that expression here uh, you only increase the problem polish society has to be treated as adult society and uh, poles have to take stock of their past just as all other societies have to do it and by this fragility or let's say vulnerability or pandering to this alleged vulnerability we only uh, let's say increase the fire of nationalist uh, prejudice and and zeal. So uh, unfortunately, Poland, uh, or fortunately, Poland decided to throw its lot with the European Union. But this comes, this, the membership in this club comes with a certain cost, okay? And uh, this is the cost of taking stock of your, within, in an adult way, not kids' way, in terms of your uh, perception of own wrongdoings. An example here, you can, I want to mention the museums, the museums which are which are becoming this kid's playground in Poland. Once again, looking at the at most uh, dramatic parts of Polish history in the light of uh, infantile lack of reflection. And here you can see the museum, the transformed museum of uh, World War II in Gdańsk. Here you can see at the museum of, uh, you can look at the museum of Polish uprising 1944, which basically uh, presents the most bloody event in Polish history in a positive light. And then you can look at the recently created museum of uh, Warsaw Ghetto, uh, which is still under construction. It's guiding sentence um, announced by the Minister of Culture who funds the whole thing was that uh, now we are going to build a museum to commemorate Polish Jewish love. Well, if you build a museum of Warsaw Ghetto, I don't think this should be your idea of uh, historical exactitude. So the thing is, uh, to answer your question, I believe that European, and I, I of course, I, I, I know that my words will have no meaning here because diplomats do their things in any case their own way. But I believe that uh, trying to offer some kind of a discount on history only will aggravate the problems that we see right now. Okay, I see. Perhaps what I had in mind was a kind of equivalent to the German project of Vergangenheitsbewältigung, coming to terms with the past. I take your point about not always using kid gloves, but perhaps such a project would offer tools to help address the past but is sensitive enough. Well, and but I can tell you one thing that, 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 that if you try if you try to convince nationalist Polish society or nationalist parts of Polish society that they need any kind of reckoning with the past, then already then you create run into a storm of indignation because then you say, what are you comparing our society, victims, let's say, based on victim status to German society? And this slows the discussion before it even began. Indeed. And the comparison is a problematic one, I agree. I simply meant this in terms of a project, the fact that it is a structured approach from the West rather than a looser expectation of just good behavior or liberal norms, however one defines those, including perhaps tools to support and fund that process. But I readily admit this is a reflection rather than a concrete proposal. And like you, as a historian, I mainly rely on publishing work, hopefully based on merit. With that, Professor, I'd like to thank you very warmly once again for your time. Congratulations once again on your work and various awards. Thank you. And I look forward to our listeners engaging with this discussion and with luck, other parties, considering these engaged suggestions within a wider context. Thank you again very much. Thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you, thank you so much.